um, let's just let everyone come in. So we're gonna have the room open. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. So we will have a short video to play before we begin. And can I please ask our tech team to display the video? Sure, Amara, wait a minute. you got tomorrow thank you very much and hello everyone good morning good afternoon good evening depending wherever you are right now greetings to all of you a big welcome to our first global webinar with the team of access to universal inclusive and safe quality education as a part of c20 global webinar series held by education digitalization and civic space working group Thank you to all of you who are attending this webinar today. Pleasure to have you online with us. My name is Tamara and I'm the Regional External Communication Senior Officer for Safety Children International and I'll be your moderator for today. We're honored to be here with a list of experts and it's my pleasure to introduce them to you. We have Mr. Sugeng Bahagyo, the Chair of C20 and Executive Director of International NGO Forum on Indonesia and Development. So Mr. Sugeng, maybe you can wave your hand so we can see you. And we also have uh, Dr. Iwan Shahril, the chair of C20, the chair of G20 Education Working Group, and director general of Teachers and Education Personnel for Ministry of Education, Culture, Research, and Technology of Indonesia. We have a youth representative here as well. We have Putri Gayatri from Children and Youth Advocacy Network, Emma Wagner from Save the Children UK as a head of Education and Policy and Advocacy. And we have Dr. Yigar Jogya, who's representative of Halifa bin Zayed Al Nahyan Foundation, and also associate professor in mental health and education. So the main objectives of this webinar are to first understand the challenges as well as opportunities related to access to universal, inclusive, and safe quality education during and post the pandemic, 
to build awareness among C20 audience and voice out concern around educational inequalities during and after the pandemic. And last but not least, to gather insights as well as best practices from all the experts here on how we can recover together, recover stronger. For those of you who are joining on Zoom, I humbly request you to please kindly mute your mic if you're not speaking. And if you have any questions or comments, please write them down on the chat box. And if you're watching us from our YouTube or Facebook channel, you're also welcome to drop your comments there. We also have the sign language interpreter and transcriber to guide you. But if you face any technical difficulties, please let us know and our technical team will pick it up. Also an important note, once again, to all the panelists, there will be a bell ring to notify you that you have two minutes left to go over your session. And uh, yeah, without further ado, I'm handing it over now to Mr. Sugeng Bahagio to officially open this webinar. Over to you, Mr. Sugeng. Uh, apology, I think you're still on mute. Yes, uh, thank you so much and my deep appreciation for the hard work and commitment of the education working group. So uh, I'm proud to be here to uh, give my welcome remarks. So again, uh, uh, allow me uh, to say uh, hello and respect to Excellency Dr. Iwan Sahril, Distinguished speakers, uh, uh, Dr. <coughs> Dr. Jigar Joga Khalifa and Mr. Rene Raya, uh, Mrs. Emma Wagner, and also uh, representative from the youth, uh, uh, mohon maaf lupa namanya. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, uh, this is a very uh, important uh, event in our uh, uh, working group uh, development of, uh, I mean, uh, uh, in the process of developing our policy proposal. So, we have a, a organized this and to get input and to uh, to sharpen the policy proposal as well as to bring as much as perspective as possible uh, so that C20 is really, the voice of C20 is really uh, inclusive. Um, let me uh, 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 start with, with, with uh, a little bit introduction, uh, Dr. Uh, Iwan, that C20 is one of the official engagement group under C20, Indonesia Presidency. Uh, our job is to provide platform for civil society uh, worldwide to bring forth the political dialogue with leaders in C20 countries. Under C20, uh, we have uh, education, digitalization, and civic space working group, which today organize uh, yes uh, representative uh, mbak putri gayatri uh, my apologies yes um, so we have uh, seven working group and one of the working group is education digitalization and civic space working group who already has 125 members uh, may, and maybe more according to latest data coming from 38 countries to to and and, and the way broad number of participation, we aim to ensure the inclusion of all civil society voice uh, in the G20 agendas, including in accessing and getting a quality education for all and digitalization. Our objective with the series of this meeting is to understand the challenge and opportunity in education digitalization uh, especially during and post pandemic by gathering insight and perspective from the relevant expert, sharing best practice from different contexts, methods and countries, and in generating an option of solution that will be part of recommendation and us policy us in the C20 Indonesia policy paper. 
a series of global webinar related to the priority agenda set by G20 Indonesia and to diversify or to enrich our perspective and take into account this, those various voices. Today is the first global webinar with topic of on access to universal inclusive, universal inclusive and safe quality education, followed by the second on June 8 with the topic of transformative digital technology for equitable education. And then the third will be on June of 10 with the topic of gender equality, diversity and social inclusion in education, digitalization and civic space. And the fourth, it will be held in 20, 29 of June with the topic of empowering youth with 21st century skill. Our overall focus on the agenda of the education working group led by Ministry of Education, Culture and Research and Technology and Digital Economy led by Ministry of Information Technology and Development Working Group led by Ministry of National Development Planning of BAPNAS, Employment Working Group led by Ministry of Manpower, and lastly, Empower Initiative led by Ministry of Women Empowerment and Child Protection. We also try to align with U20 and Women20 Engagement Group as well as UN bodies such as UNICEF, UN Women, and ILO to raise the important issues in education, digitalization, and civic space. With the various insight and feedback, it will sharpen our recommendation on how to overcome educational inequalities and education recovery. Last but not least, let's make this global webinar an, an opportunity for us to make voices from civil society heard and consider for a stronger and inclusive post-recovery uh, COVID. So thank you so much. And I wish a very productive and useful uh, webinar today. And uh, uh, we'll continue next time with the second and the third. So again, congratulate for the congratulations for the this event for the uh, education working group, and thank you so much for Dr. Iwan Sahril for uh, attending our meeting, and hopefully it will be a, 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 a fruitful cooperation between us, the C20 working group, and the G20 working group. Uh, thank you so much. Mohon maaf kurang lebihnya. Over to you, Tamara. Thank you. Thank you very much for the warm welcome, Mr. Sugeng. Indeed, please serve this global webinar as an opportunity to make voices from the public as well as civil society leaders heard for the stronger COVID-19 recovery. And yes, uh, this webinar is actually the first batch of the overall global webinar series, as we're going to have another three upcoming webinars related to the G20 education priorities. But as for today, we'll be focusing on strategies to provide equal access to inclusive, universal, and quality education. And I think when I talk about access, um, it's well recognized that the pandemic has taken a toll on the education sector. More than two years, the COVID-19 pandemic has exposed us to the educational inequalities that has led to severe learning loss among students across multiple backgrounds around the world. So um, understanding the four G20 education working group priorities, so which are in universal quality of education, digital technology for education, solidarity and partnership, and the future of work post COVID-19, it is now more critical than ever to put these priorities at the heart of the G20 summit this year to support education recovery. I'm here today joining in with Dr. Iwan Shahril. So Dr. Iwan is the chair of G20 Education Working Group, and he is also the Director General of Teachers and Education Personnel for Ministry of Education, Culture, Research, and Technology of Indonesia. He, Dr. Iwan completed his undergrad degree majoring in international relations at Pajajaran University in Bandung, Indonesia in 1998. He then continued his master's degree at Teachers College, Columbia University in New York and earned two degrees, namely Master of Arts in Secondary Education and then a Master of Education in Curriculum and Teaching. Dr. Iwan also holds a Doctor of Philosophy from Michigan State University from two doctoral programs, Education Policy and Teachers Education. 
So now during his stint at the Ministry of Education, Culture, Research and Technology, Dr. Iwan has been leading on many educational innovations for teachers and school programs in emancipated learning or known as Merdeka Belajar in Bahasa Indonesia, Guru Penggerak, which is a teacher's ambassador program to elevate Indonesia teachers' capacity in leadership. Dr. Iwan has also been a consultant for the United Nations Development Program at Jakarta office, designing the SDGs Leadership Academy curriculum. So it's a pleasure to have you here again, Dr. Iwan, and the next 20 minutes is yours. Thank you so much, Tamara. Uh, good afternoon. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, salam sejahtera bagi kita semua, Om Swastiastu, Om Budaya, Salam Kebajikan. Excellencies, uh, Mr. Sugeng Bahagio, uh, Ms. Putri Gayatri, uh, Mr. Rene uh, Raya, Dr. Jigar Jokja, uh, Ms. Emma Wagner, uh, all the guests, uh, participants, uh, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, I'd like to thank uh, C20 Engagement Group for inviting me to participate in this forum. Uh, this forum has a crucial importance in ensuring the inclusion of civil society voices in the G20 Presidency of Indonesia. Uh, especially in this uh, today, we're talking about the education agenda. I firmly believe that the C20 support represented by this forum will further enrich the four main agendas put forward by the Education Working Group. Uh, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, as we all know, in the G20 Indonesia presidency, the Ministry of uh, Education, Culture, Research and Technology of the Republic of Indonesia leads the G20 Education Working Group. Uh, we take the opportunity to have uh, to lead the global movement to reimagine and rebuild the education system as a form of our commitment to achieve the 2030 Sustainable Development Goals in a full spirit to emerge stronger and start a new chapter. Last year, the Italian Presidency's Education Working Group had discussed the surrounding issues regarding educational poverty and inequality in access to education during the COVID-19 pandemic in an extensive manner. It is imperative for us to not only continue but reinforce initiatives proposed during the Italian presidency to accelerate global education recovery. On that note, G20 member countries need to work hand in hand to emerge stronger from the scarring impacts of the multi-dimensional crisis imposed by COVID-19 as represented by the theme of this year's Indonesia's presidency, Recover Together, Recover Stronger. Along with that theme, there are four priority issues in education that are being being discussed uh, during uh, our presidency. The first is universal quality education. This priority arises from the challenge of encouraging equal access to quality education at all levels. Uh, especially here, we are putting more special attention to the vulnerable groups. Uh, and this is very important for our recovery. This priority also affirms Indonesia's commitment to ensure inclusive and equitable quality education and promote lifelong learning opportunities for all in accordance with the goal number four of 2030 Sustainable Development Goals. The second issue is digital technologies in education. It is indeed our objective to discuss and bring out solutions to the problems of access, quality, and social justice in the education sector by the use of digital technology while also recognizing the challenges of the digital divide and collectively seek adaptive solutions to close the digital divide. The third one is the solidarity and partnership, gotong royong or helping each other or mutual cooperation, a value that we hold dearly in Indonesia that is serve as the basis of this priority. We recognize the urgency to act in solidarity and partnership in the spirit of mutual cooperation or gotong royong to build a more resilient and effective education system. A global movement is the strategy that we need to address global challenges and create a better tomorrow for all of us. And the last issue is uh, the future of work post COVID-19. The Minister of Education, Culture, Research and Technology of the Republic of Indonesia believes that the needs of the world of work after the COVID-19 pandemic have changed. The education sector, therefore, should bring out the transformation that responds to the challenges of an ever-changing landscape of work and industry in the future. Uh, next, I'd like to share um, a few slides uh, just to, uh, to go a bit deeper for... Um, can you see the slide now? Yes, okay, thank you. 
So uh, here's uh, like if we break down in each priority issue, we can see that our four agenda for the first one, the universal quality education. Here uh, we are focuses on how to overcome the rapid rise of the education inequality and learning poverty that uh, already uh, the learning crisis uh, already uh, took place before the COVID, but then exacerbated by the pandemic. And we need to strengthen our commitment to SDG4 or to inclusive education or the universal quality education for all. Um, and therefore, uh, in the effort for recovery, we believe that we need to strengthen the basic competencies that, uh, of course, we have a lot of uh, challenges, but the basic competencies, namely like such as the literacy and numeracy and the character that we believe are the foundations for lifelong learning uh, needs to be protected and needs to be the focus. So instead of uh, going uh, to cover everything, we need to hyper focus on the most essential competencies uh, in our recovery. The second priority, uh, digital technology in education, we feel that we need to optimize and safeguard the use of digital technology and also to leverage the use of digital technology beyond the conventional boundaries, while at the same time, we also need to think about because the uniqueness of Indonesia's presence, we bring the voices of the uh, developing countries, uh, especially in our special invitees, that maybe have some challenges in terms of the access or the infrastructure to uh, uh, to the sporting uh, uh, infrastructure for digital uh, network. Um, so how to address uh, the context in which uh, very limited in terms of the resources uh, in using the digital technology. This is something also that uh, is being discussed in the education working group. And the third one is the solidarity and partnership in which we believe that the foundation for the recovery for reimagining a better and more resilient education system is the collaboration of all stakeholders. The intersectoral collaboration is very important and all communities at all levels, all stakeholders need to find uh, ways to collaborate uh, towards a shared goal, which is the, the education of all our children. And the last priority, the future of work, uh, here we highlight how we need to transform the vocational and education uh, high, uh, and higher education institutions to meet the, the, uh, the, the changing landscape of the future uh, job market. And therefore, we need to think about uh, and also uh, share the conditions and strategies that are needed for successful transformation, both in vocational and higher education institutions. Um, and also in response to the uh, to the uh, concept note that was sent to me, um, so uh, as the part of the education working group, as the chair of education working group, I'd like to highlight several of the strategies that were discussed in our uh, meetings. We already had uh, two meetings uh, to overcome education inequalities uh, and to promote education recovery in the post COVID nineteen. Uh, here in this slide, particularly. Uh, concerning the issue of uh, access, especially access to free and safe, inclusive, equitable quality education, including uh, education of uh, girls and children with uh, disabilities. One of the strategies that was discussed was about building the programs that specifically target children in vulnerable situations and at risk of exclusion. And here, of course, uh, girls, uh, uh, these are the students with disabilities are among like the, uh, the groups that need special attention and therefore need uh, special strategies. Uh, and the principle of the, that education is the foundation of uh, realizing of all other human rights, I think it's important for all countries uh, to, uh, to uh, strengthen their commitment towards this. Uh, and the third one is about expanding the availability of distance education and internet connectivity to teachers and students by constructing infrastructure in remote areas. I think here is, um, we know like the, the promise of the digital technology uh, for improving access uh, uh, and quality and also uh, equity. So uh, I think one of the uh, suggestions by the member countries is uh, to think about how we can uh, push the development of the infrastructure, especially in remote areas um, for digital infrastructure. Uh, and the third one is to reduce the cost of uh, childcare to support women who are uh, who need to work. Uh, so therefore, they are not constrained by uh, the situation because of uh, the childcare cost is very high. 
Um, and uh, some countries also discuss about how to utilize uh, different medias. Uh, yes, we have the internet, but also we also have television, radio, uh, and also digital textbooks uh, in provision of the basic education service and digital learning, especially when we are still struggling with the infrastructure. Um, and last here that I would like to share is uh, the uh, social emotional condition is something that uh, is uh, uh, emphasized by many countries and the importance of in our recovery to focus on uh, the support for psychopedagogical services are uh, not only to the students but also uh, the, their families. Um, and next, uh, I'd like to highlight uh, uh, strategies that particularly uh, focusing on elevating and uh, guaranteeing funding at all levels to meet the needs of the most disadvantaged children and also teacher competencies development. Uh, the first one, of course, uh, specific uh, financial programs such as grants or need-based loans for students to cover uh, academic and living costs, so to prevent drop out to uh, reduce the dropout rates. Uh, and the second one is about sponsoring programs which increase access and opportunities for teachers to improve teaching quality. And here, what the uh, the member countries talk about is how to involve, like, a, a, let's say, private sectors or uh, other like civil society organizations to help sponsor uh, the programs so teachers can deal with the challenges uh, that they are facing uh, during the pandemic and beyond. And the third one is about increasing the amount of available uh, financial aid in economically weaker regions to encourage students pursuing higher education. Because in uh, these kind of regions, I think are more vulnerable for the dropout rates and also uh, uh, for the uh, weaker strategies for uh, school engagement and the quality of teaching and learning process. And last is about distributing funds to schools uh, to assist their most disadvantaged students in accessing digital learning in remote and hybrid education. Here, for example, uh, some countries share about their uh, policy to help the students and teachers with the internet uh, data uh, quota. So therefore can help uh, their, those students to access uh, digital learning uh, in their areas. And in terms of collaboration, uh, the coordinated effort between school authorities, families, and communities for stronger, um, uh, better holistic education of every child. Uh, here, uh, there's some strategies involved about developing networks to connect schools, communities, and other government and non-government stakeholders. And also how industry can also be part of the uh, important players, like inviting them to come to schools to develop the curriculum, to so make the learning more relevant to towards the students, uh, providing recommendation for teachers and parents on maintaining well being of their children, especially in facing the pandemic. Uh, the next one is about implementing elaborate education system transformation, which enable increased roles of families, uh, as well as expert and local communities. So it's like collaboration of many stakeholders. And also number five, involving youth serving organizations to provide academic and non academic support for students. We believe that the peer tutoring and especially uh, with more senior students uh, helping the younger ones uh, for especially basic competencies can also be a solution uh, to overcome uh, inequalities and uh, promote uh, recovery. And uh, also, uh, last but not least, about establishing partnerships with other countries or international organizations to provide education and exposure of students. Um, again, if we are aligned that like the the purpose of our recovery is to help our students, especially on the basic competencies. I think uh, there are many opportunities for partnerships with uh, not only domestically, but also at, at the global level. And my final slide is I want to hyper focus on how Indonesia, uh, especially in our policy of Merdeka Belajar or emancipated learning, uh, think about the strategy to overcome the educational inequalities and promoting educational recovery. Uh, the first one is about our uh, education system evaluation transformation. I think we want to get rid of teach to the test uh, mindset. Instead of we want to uh, our students to have meaningful and, and engaging uh, learning opportunities and therefore can develop especially their foundational competencies that make them ready to uh, a more disruptive era going forward. And here the highlight is about uh, uh, literacy, numeracy, and also the building of the character, school climate, the learning environments need to be very supportive. The second one is the, the, the curriculum. 
what we learned during the COVID is the more simple, flexible curriculum actually can help the learning recovery much faster. So therefore, our new curriculum, Merdeka, is designed based on this philosophy. It's much simple, uh, much more simple, uh, more flexible, and more relevant, and giving the aut autonomy for the, both the students to allow their voices and choices in of the process of teaching and learning, and for teachers to differentiate the instruction and support the students more holistically. We also believe in the use of technology, but the what we want to invest is that what we believe technology cannot replace the, the humans uh, at the end of the day. It's about the human being that's still the most important part in the teaching and learning process. Um, so therefore, our platform is more like how to help the adults, how to help the teachers uh, upgrade their competencies, how they can uh, uh, we can help the principals reduce the administrative burden so then they can uh, improve the quality of their services to their uh, students. And the next one is about the educational assistance, both the early education and the school assistance. We change the structure uh, for uh, our educational assistance program from the one that is like a uniform for all regions in Indonesia with now with a more like differentiated based on uh, the, the index of the living cost. If the living cost, especially in the remote areas, which is much higher, they will get more funding from the government. So it's not like one size fits all approach, but more uh, social justice based approach. And higher education scholarship expansion. Again, here we focus on not only like the expand the coverage, but how the families from the low income uh, in income families can get access to the highest or the world class, even world class uh, level of education opportunities, uh, which previously it was difficult for them. So we increase the 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 price point so these uh, students uh, from uh, low income families can access uh, expensive programs like, such as medical uh, or, or others, uh, which previously they couldn't uh, access that because the scholarship amount is very low. And then uh, pioneering organizations, we believe in the movement civil society together to improve the education again, because the government that does not know, uh, it's not the only one who knows all. We believe a lot of wisdoms of practice and experience are spread out throughout the uh, society. Uh, the, our campus, our emancipated uh, uh, camp, uh, higher education program. Uh, one of the highlights here is we allow like three semesters of, uh, of the students' time in the bachelor's degree to, uh, that they can take outside their major, even outside their campus, like uh, projects or uh, uh, developing like startup and et cetera, that we believe, or uh, internship that we believe that is as important as uh, part of the curriculum that they receive uh, inside their uh, their major. And last but not least about the vocational education transformation in which here is we need to improve the uh, uh, collaboration between the industry and the schools or universities. So then the students learn the much more relevant skills that are uh, job ready for the future. Um, I think um, overall, uh, the conversation in the education working group is still going. We just have like the, the uh, we just had the second meeting like two weeks ago, and we have two more uh, working group meetings to go. So there are going to be a lot of uh, uh, new ideas and insights that will be shared by the member countries. But excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, uh, the valuable uh, experiences and all these best practices from the G20 member countries and special invitees uh, will serve as an important step for all of us in our journey to recover together and recover stronger, creating a more equitable, sustainable, and inclusive education for all our children in the world. These agendas reaffirm our commitment to create and ensure inclusive and equitable quality education, especially in hard times such as today. We hope that uh, through this presentation and this sharing, uh, we can learn how G20 member countries and special invitees are thinking about addressing disparities in access to quality education as part of our efforts to recover together and recover stronger. We believe that with the spirit of Gotong Royong, supporting and helping each other, we can put recover together, recover stronger into concrete and meaningful actions. Thank you. Thank you very much for the very comprehensive speech, Dr. Yuan. Um, I can tell everyone in the room resonates with your points a lot, particularly when it comes to what's needed to be done 
to learn from the pandemic in order to build stronger learning recovery with these four priorities you just mentioned. And as you mentioned, Dr. Iwan, uh, girls' education has been specifically challenged by the COVID-19 pandemic, especially for girls from low-income households due to many different reasons we can name it, extreme poverty, child marriage, loss of livelihoods, and so on. So um, it's great that we have a youth representative here joining us today, Putri Gayatri, who can share her experience how school closures and online learning has affected her and other children as well as the other youth. So it's my pleasure to introduce Putri. Putri is a youth representative of Children and Youth Advocacy Network, which is known as CN, and a student at Bogor Agricultural Institute, majoring in communications and community development. And since 2015, she also has been engaged in several initiatives within Safety Children Indonesia to promote the child and youth participation in decision making. Putri was also selected to be a child delegate at United Nations General Assembly 70 and also a youth speaker at International Monetary Fund annual meeting. So Putri will be speaking in Bahasa. So if you're watching this and if you're a non-Bahasa speaker, I invite you to please click on the globe button down there on your Zoom screen to auto-translate it to English. And let's hear it from you, Putri. Okay, hey, uh, thank you so much, Kak Tamara. Hello everyone, let me speak in Bahasa. Uh, selamat sore, Bapak-Bapak, Ibu-Ibu, dan teman-teman semua. Uh, yang saya hormati Pak Sugeng, Pak Iwan, uh, Pak Rene, Dr. Jigar, uh, Bu Emma Wagner, dan teman-teman uh, semua. Terima kasih banyak atas kesempatan yang luar biasa memberi kami, anak muda, ruang untuk menyampaikan apa yang menjadi keresahan dan harapan kami. T20 Global Webinar ini menjadi momen yang sangat berarti bagi saya bisa berjumpa dengan Bapak-Ibu semua dan membicarakan realita, upaya, dan komitmen kita bersama untuk pendidikan yang lebih aman, berkualitas, inklusif, dan setara. Berbicara tentang situasi saat ini, ya memang benar COVID-19 merubah kehidupan banyak sekali anak dan kaum muda. Penutupan sekolah dan pembelajaran online memaksa kami untuk mengakses pembelajaran yang terbatas karena kami harus bergantung pada device, sinyal internet, teknologi yang nyatanya masih menjadi sesuatu yang eksklusif dan sulit untuk digapai. Kami juga sering berada dalam situasi kebingungan dengan kondisi di mana kami tak punya banyak pilihan bahkan untuk sekedar mengakses materi pembelajaran yang lain dan berkualitas. Kesenjangan semakin terasa karena dalam situasi krisis, seringkali anak perempuanlah yang harus mengalah dan dikorbankan. Dalam keterbatasan sumber daya yang mengharuskan orang tua memilih siapa yang akan diberangkatkan ke sekolah, siapa yang akan disekolahkan, seringkali perempuan bukan menjadi prioritas utama. Kesenjangan dan ketidakadilan gender terjadi dalam bentuk perkawinan anak yang ditunjukkan dengan data dari UNICEF yang menyatakan bahwa satu dari sembilan anak perempuan menjadi korban perkawinan anak dibanding satu dari seratus anak laki-laki yang menjadi korban perkawinan anak. Data yang sangat signifikan dan menunjukkan bahwa anak perempuan masih menjadi kelompok yang rentan dan terpinggirkan. Jika ketidakadilan gender diteruskan, maka anak perempuan akan semakin tertinggal. Dan pada akhirnya, perkawinan anak menjadi pilihan logis bagi keluarga ketika alternatif untuk melanjutkan pendidikan tidak tersedia untuk anak perempuan. Hal ini terus berlangsung pada masyarakat patriarki yang menempatkan preferensi sosial lebih tinggi untuk anak laki-laki dan status sosial yang lebih rendah untuk anak perempuan. Kawinan dipandang sebagai satu-satunya pilihan yang layak untuk anak perempuan sementara anak laki-laki didorong untuk mencari pekerjaan atau pendapatan lain yang menghasilkan pilihan yang lebih banyak. Dengan penutupan sekolah, sekolah online, hybrid, dan juga kesempatan kerja yang terbatas, keluarga lebih memilih untuk mengawinkan anak perempuan mereka lebih awal dengan harapan mengurangi tanggungan keluarga. Padahal anak perempuan juga punya hak yang dijamin untuk mengakses pendidikan, hak tumbuh kembang untuk mencapai potensi optimalnya, sehingga menjadi sosok dewasa yang berdaya, bahkan berpotensi besar untuk menjadi pahlawan dalam meningkatkan kesejahteraan keluarga. Namun, sayangnya hal itu tidak pernah dipandang sebagai pilihan yang meyakinkan. Shifting pembelajaran tatap muka ke pembelajaran daring tidak serta-merta menghilangkan risiko kekerasan. Yang dulunya ada di sekolah, sekarang ada di genggaman anak-anak. Kekerasan itu bergeser dan berpindah dari ruang luring menuju ruang daring yang kini interaksinya justru semakin dekat dengan anak-anak. Kekerasan berbasis gender online 
atau KBGO pun tidak dapat dipungkiri. Pelecehan online, keretasan, pelanggaran privasi, membuat ekosistem belajar online menjadi menakutkan bagi kami. Sekelompok orang menyalahgunakan keleluasan dunia maya untuk melecehkan, mengintimidasi, dan merendahkan. Dan anak perempuan seringkali menjadi korban yang paling rentan. Padahal hak atas rasa aman dan hak untuk mendapatkan pendidikan yang bebas dari kekerasan adalah sebuah keharusan. Kami bisa merasakan guncangan dan trauma mendalam dari sahabat kami yang menjadi korban kekerasan seksual, bahkan dilakukan oleh tenaga pendidik. Mengejutkannya, hal ini jadi di institusi pendidikan yang seharusnya ramah dan jadi tempat teraman untuk kami. Sejak saat itu, teman kami menghilang, mengisolasi diri, mengisolasi diri dan enggan kembali bersekolah. Kekerasan berbasis gender online tidak dapat dilihat dan dipahami hanya sebagai kekerasan terhadap perempuan melalui internet atau teknologi digital saja. Hal ini sama berbahayanya dengan kekerasan fisik terhadap korban. Teknologi digital telah memperkuat kemudahan untuk praktik kekerasan dan meningkatkan risiko dampak yang ditimbulkan. Kami membutuhkan lebih banyak inisiatif yang berfokus pada advokasi kekerasan berbasis gender online yang mendorong partisipasi berbagai pihak, terutama melalui literasi digital, penyebar luasan kesadaran, saluran bantuan, serta rekomendasi kebijakan. Kami percaya lingkungan online yang aman disertai pemanfaatan teknologi informasi yang baik dapat membantu pengguna, khususnya pelajar, anak perempuan, untuk mendapatkan manfaat positif dari internet dan terus berkarya. Kami percaya Bapak Ibu memiliki kekuatan untuk mengakselerasi perubahan ini. Perubahan untuk pendidikan yang lebih aman, inklusif, adil untuk setiap anak. Beberapa perubahan yang ingin kami lihat meliputi yang pertama memberikan kesempatan dan ruang untuk mendorong anak perempuan, terutama penyintas perkawinan anak untuk kembali ke sekolah. Jangan biarkan uh, sistem dropout atau culture yang mendorong anak perempuan ini yang terjadi di sekolah melegitimasi pelanggaran hak atas pendidikan bagi anak perempuan. Yang kedua, membangun kemitraan dengan sektor pendidikan untuk mendidik para guru dan siswa tentang bagaimana cara mengatasi diskriminasi gender di lingkungan sekolah. Memastikan guru dan tenaga pendidik memiliki pengetahuan dan keterampilan untuk mengurangi risiko kekerasan berbasis gender. Memastikan anak-anak memiliki akses hingga mekanisme pengaduan dan pelaporan di sekolah. Mendukung akses ke alat digital untuk pendidikan, kesehatan, layanan perlindungan sosial untuk anak dan keluarga. Memastikan anak perempuan dan disabilitas memiliki kesempatan yang sama untuk mengakses pembelajaran jarak jauh dengan perangkat platform dan materi yang ramah dan mudah diakses, serta memastikan adanya payung hukum untuk mencegah, menangani, dan memulihkan untuk merespon keamanan dan perlindungan dari kekerasan di dunia pendidikan digital. Saya sangat mengapresiasi uh, telah lahirnya Permendikbud PPKS, penanganan dan pencegahan kekerasan seksual di kampus, uh, dan saya sangat berharap implementasi kebijakan ini segera terasa untuk menciptakan lingkungan pendidikan yang aman, ramah untuk setiap anak untuk menciptakan sekolah dan kampus yang aman. Ketika pendidikan berpindah menuju dari sekolah menuju pembelajaran online, pemerintah dan praktisi pendidikan harus memantau dan terus mengawal partisipasi siswa untuk memastikan dan merespon dengan cepat strategi untuk mempertahankan dan melibatkan kembali anak-anak perempuan di sekolah. Perkawinan anak adalah penjajahan dan kami adalah pejuang. Dengan pendidikan yang aman, inklusif, dan setara, kami yakin kami akan menang. Sekian dari saya, terima kasih. Uh, saya kembalikan ke Tamara. Thank you very much for your super powerful message, Putri. So I just would like to recap a bit of what you just said in English for the benefit of the audience here. So Putri expressed how uh, the pandemic has hit the hardest to reach adolescent girls and many who did not get access to online learnings have experienced learning loss and may never return to school again due to child marriage and due to the loss of economic incomes then the families have to give up on girls' education in order to support the other bits of economical households. And these affect particularly girls from the poorest households. And she also expressed how G20 leaders should put marginalized children, particularly girls, at the heart of the recovery plan to build a more resilient and better recovery. 
So uh, related to Putri's point, I think when we talk about students from the most deprived and marginalized communities, the COVID-19 pandemic is actually not the first time that these students' education has been interrupted. So the poorest and most marginalized children, like children with disabilities, refugees, children who live in a war and conflict zones, have already been experiencing barriers to access to education long before the pandemic hit. And this COVID-19 has exacerbated these barriers. So in that case, I'd like to turn to Emma Wagner to let her share more about policy strategies for governments and donors to ensure equitable learning for disadvantaged students. These include girls, children with disabilities, and those in disaster prone areas to keep the learning in violence free environment. Emma is the head of education, policy, and advocacy for Save the Children UK. And before joining Save the Children, she co founded Umoja Tanzania, which is a successful youth education charity in Arusha, Tanzania. She is also the chair of Umoja UK, a UK registered charity. And she has worked for eight years uh, with Save the Children UK and then uh, in a public affairs and in the global education team. She leads a team who develop and implement a range of priority um, education policy and strategies. And these include on topics such as education in emergencies, refugee education, girls education, and education financing. She is a member of the Interagency Network for Education in Emergencies, the Send My Friend to School campaign, the Moving Minds Alliance, and the Civil Society Constituency for Education Cannot Wait. So the next 10 minutes is yours, Emma, and over to you. Fantastic, thank you very much. I'm just sharing my slides. Hopefully you can see that now. Yeah. Thank you so much for inviting me to speak today. And it's a pleasure to be amongst really fantastic speakers um, and amazing to follow Putri who gave such a powerful speech. Uh, thank you so much for, for sharing your, all your experiences. Um, I just wanted to say a little bit about Save the Children first before going into the presentation. We're still working out our, our figures for 2020, but in 20, uh, sorry, for 2021. But in 2020, Save the Children worked across 80 countries, reaching 12 million children directly through education programming. And this included our response to COVID-19 school closures. This also included reaching 6.8 million children in humanitarian crises in 77 countries with education support. And these were contexts that were further compounded by the COVID-19 pandemic. So I've been asked to speak today about policy strategies to ensure children most affected by poverty and inequality get a safe, inclusive and quality education. This is a bit of a gloomy slide. Um, it has a number of stats. I'm sure you're quite familiar with a number of them and I'm not gonna go through them all, but I just really wanted to set the scene in terms of um, you know, how many children were out of school in the pandemic and what this has meant for their learning. We carried out a global survey of 20, 25,000 children and we found that four in five learned little or nothing at all while out of school. And of course, we know it's girls, children with disabilities, um, children affected by crisis, uh, children in rural areas that are really um, the ones who have been left behind. Um, and the World Bank says that in low and middle income countries, the share of children living in learning poverty, which was already uh, very high even before the pandemic, will actually rise even uh, higher, up to 70% um, of children um, in the coming years as a result of the pandemic. I guess what I really wanted to show with this slide is that um, we already had an existing education crisis before the pandemic. And as some of the speakers have already said, the, this crisis has really been exacerbated further by the pandemic. And we urgently need to address, um, address these crises as soon as possible to ensure that children can fulfill their right and that the most marginalized children can uh, fulfill their education. Um, so what these numbers really do is paint a stark picture of how far off track we were for meeting the global education goals even before the pandemic, particularly for children most impacted by inequality and dis uh, discrimination. However, what the global picture does not illustrate 
is the extent of the problem, problem in regions and countries where children are hardest hit by the learning crisis, namely in sub-Saharan Africa, South Asia, and in fragile and conflict-affected countries. Last year, we um, at Save the Children, we looked at um, how can we assess um, education systems around the world? Um, and so we decided to create this risks to education index, which um, ranks countries by their vulnerability of their school system to hazards, vulnerability and deficiencies in preparedness. And this enables us to make a holistic assessment of the risks to education. And it suggests which education systems require increased attention and resources from their national governments, but also from international actors to mitigate these crises. And I think it's really important to note that high vulnerability and exposure to hazards does not always mean high risk. A country can have high risk exposure, but with good preparation, this reduces the overall net risk. So the data we used, um, and you can look at the methodology in our uh, report, covers um, public data sources from six different factors. And we looked at climate change vulnerability, COVID-19 vaccine availability, attacks on schools, um, as well as other uh, data sources. And we combined that data and calculated together to provide an overall country ranking. And it was over, over you know, all the countries in the world that we had credible data for. So what you can see here, the 10 countries that we ranked at extreme or high risk. And we argue that these are the countries that really need the most support um, from the international community. And we'll actually be pu publishing um, an updated country ranking in September. So I hope you'll be able to look out for that. So um, the report I mentioned, we actually called Build Forward Better. Um, building back better has long been used in response to crises globally and is being frequently used today. However, given the scale of the learning crisis that existed before the pandemic, which has now become even more severe, we think it's really vital that we do not limit ourselves to the ambition of building back to how things were. Now it's imperative that we build forward better and differently. We must question the foundations of the systems that have proven so fragile in the face of this level of disruption. And we need to recognize that the crisis is an opportunity for hope and positive change. So that's why we called our report uh, Build Forward Better. One of the main themes of the report and kind of what we did was look back at our lessons learned uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic, but also our experience of delivering, delivering education um, to children around the world for many decades, was to think about how can education systems be better prepared to respond to um, a whole range of crises that impact, um, impact them. Um, what we do know is that when multiple compounding crises and failed recovery have knock-on effects um, that trap children in cycle of education marginalization. And that's why it's really critical that education systems are strengthened to prepare and withstand shocks. Otherwise, the impact of current and future crises on children's learning, well-being and protection and on the future economic and social development of nations will be devastating. Um, in efforts to build forward better, high income countries must take steps to address the underlying systemic causes of inequality, climate change, conflict and insecurity. What we realised during uh, the pandemic was that every Ministry of Education, whether in high, middle or low income countries, really needed to better prepare to respond to crises to ensure that learning can continue and children's rights can be fulfilled. And the pandemic, the pandemic therefore highlighted the need for iterative planning that is flexible enough to allow for anticipatory action based on forecasted or real time data. We think that we can predict with increasing confidence the occurrence and potential impact of certain climatic events, political and conflict dynamics and diseases. Neither the shock nor the impact of the on the communities without early action should come as a surprise. So uh, we are encouraging all member states to use this anticipatory action framework, which is outlined on this slide, 
if we have really good uh, available data, that can really help decision makers agree to release pre-arranged funds for pre-agreed interventions that take place before such shocks occur in order to mitigate their impact. And by taking this anticipatory approach, using analysis of risk as well as need, education ministries, along with the humanitarian community, can better meet learning and well-being needs. I then wanted to um, talk briefly about one of the programmes that we have that we think is a really innovative way um, of responding to children's learning, particularly the most marginalised um, and this was during the pandemic, we've actually been piloting what we're calling catch up clubs. And this is the first time that we've brought together these four different elements into one integrated program, recognizing that just kind of providing um, lessons won't just uh, solve uh, children's learning. They also need support from uh, economic support to their families. They may need mental health and protection services. And also it's important to think about how these children are grouped so that they can learn in the most effective way. So um, these are the four elements that we've brought together. Um, they're in 13 week programs and we've been piloting them places like Colombia and Uganda and other places around the world that we're expanding in. And we found this to be very successful in terms of having these four different elements in one program so that a child can really benefit from both um, really fun based remedial learning, teaching at the right level, access to social services and case management for their mental health, as well as providing cash transfers for families so that they can keep their children enrolled in the programme. And these are some of the results that we've received so far, and we're hoping to um, always improve these results going forward, considering this is the first uh, phase of piloting. But we found that um, children are really um, um, are staying enrolled in the catch-up clubs throughout the cycle, and that over half of the children enrolled have reached age appropriate foundational literacy after just one cycle. So this, pro this program is really targeted at reaching the most marginalized children to make sure that they do stay in school and they can catch up on their learning. And I think this integrated approach is one that we would really recommend others to take forward. So these are our, this is our eight point plan for action. Um, these are our recommendations for governments, the G20 and others to really think about and take forward. I'm not gonna go through all of them, but I really wanted to focus on a few. Um, I think we, for many of us in G20 countries, it may feel like uh, COVID is maybe over and things are back to normal. Um, but in many countries, that's not the case. But even still, if we think about children's, what the impact has been on children's learning over the last two and a half years, we can't forget, we can't forget that challenge that they've experienced and the long lasting in impact on them. So I think we really must, uh, you know, scale, catch up, um, scale support, um, social emotional learning and any other support that they need. And don't forget that the COVID-19 pandemic has and is continuing to have a big impact on children's lives. The second point really picks up some of the slides I presented earlier about preparedness. And so edgy, every country, every education system really must have an integrated preparedness plan to be able to respond to future crises, either at national, regional or local level in a variety of different ways um, so that children can continue to learn and that this kind of um, impact on children's learning doesn't ever happen again. Of course, we must target out of school children, those that were, weren't in school even before the pandemic. And um, as my presentation is about uh, focusing on the most marginalized, we really must reach the children most affected by inequality and discrimination first. So we would really push for what some are calling um, radical inclusion. It's what the minister from Sierra Leone is very much uh, referring to. And we would support that in terms of really taking a radical approach to reaching the most marginalized children first in education programming and just thinking of the design of those programs um, and education support with those children in mind. And then lastly, um, I was asked to say something about the Transforming Education Summit that's going to be coming up in September. 
obviously the G, this is uh, this uh, presentation and all the webinars happening are really focused on the G20, uh, rightly so. But I wanted to highlight this other opportunity where governments can be um, making commitments, where civil society can really be getting involved and young people can also be getting involved too. This is a UN um, Secretary General led global transforming education summit. So it's a really important moment. These don't always happen. Um, and it's a, really exciting that it's going to be happening, you know, a huge focus is going to be focused on education. And there are three pillars of engagement and these are happening right now and I would really encourage everybody if they're not already to get involved. You can look at the website and also follow them on Twitter. There are inclusive national consultations that are happening now until September. So every government is being asked to um, organise these consultations and develop a roadmap of how they're going to accelerate progress towards sustainable development for in the coming months and make new political commitments as well as funding commitments. There are also five thematic action tracks um, on different areas emergencies, digital learning, teachers and financing um, and teaching and learning. So um, these are public consultations that are going on at the moment and you can look at the website to take part in those and feed in. And lastly there are there's public mobilization. So at the moment this is still being developed but uh, I think there are weekly calls that you can join where discussing they'll be discussing kind of high level messaging, Twitter, how to get young people involved. And so I really think this is another opportunity where the messages from this event and all the different um, other activities that are focusing on the a C20 education group can really come forward and make an impact. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Emma, for your explanation. Very on ball and then point. Uh, so as much as COVID-19 has had a deep impact on the most deprived and marginalized students, as you just mentioned, and this actually had widened the educational gap, like access to digital resources and technological devices, I would say that even for students or children who have access to these resources have its own set of challenges with online learning itself, right? And it's also a challenge for teachers as well as families as many of them may not be able to keep up uh, the learning going at home. And this situation certainly affects their mental health as well. So given that shift uh, to the online learning during the pandemic, but I think we also need to remember that technology is inevitable to avoid as it's a part of the 21st century education skills as well. It's then uh, comes to think of it, uh, it's critical to frame a more strategic and creative approaches of online learning and teaching during and after the pandemic for better academic, social and emotional learning outcomes. So we now have uh, Dr. Jigar Yogya uh, with us to cover these approaches. So Dr. Jigar is a psychologist of a British Psychological Society. And um, oh, hold on a second, something wrong with my screen. Yep. So Dr. Jigar is a, psychological, uh, is a psychologist uh, of a British Psychological Society chartered. He's also an associate professor of uh, psychology at Zayed University, specializing in mental health, neuroscience, and cognitive psychology. He also works in uh, industry as a psychology and marketing consultant and uh, was lecturing and conducting research in psychology, psychiatry, and neuroscience at some, most, some of the most prestigious universities in the UK, including King College London, University of Birmingham, and Aston University. And he also uh, led the accreditation and launch of undergrad and postgrad programs in psychology in the United Arab Emirates. So without further ado, I'm opening the floor to you, Dr. Jigar. The next 10 minutes is yours. Thank you so much, Mara. Ladies and gentlemen, Your Excellency, it's a pleasure to be with you here today. Uh, my name is Dr. Jigar Jokia, and I'll be representing the Khalifa bin Zayed Al Nahyan Foundation. So we've mentioned previously, I think all of the speakers have mentioned that COVID-19 is exacerbating the inequalities that we face in education, and that's a global phenomenon. These already existed prior to the pandemic, but we've really come to understand this as being a deficit to learning or a learning loss in many countries. It is still being measured, but what we do know from the data that's available is that these losses vary substantially across countries and that disproportionately they affect younger learners, disabled students, those with low income backgrounds. And I think one of the previous speakers, Putri, from a student's perspective, talked about how it affects girls especially. Such inequality arises as a result of many things, socioeconomic status and equal access to remote learning and even home support. As an example, children in Kenya 
are less likely to have access to remote learning and they have limited availability of electricity and connectivity in some areas, even in schools. Potentially, it's a case of not having the right devices or technology, but also there may be social discrimination and social or gender norms at play. Education is key here in the United Arab Emirates. And in 1982, when Sheikh Zayed, the president of the UAE, was visiting Kenya, he saw for himself how great the need was and that in particular, girls were not being encouraged to learn. He therefore built and equipped a school in Mombasa and arranged for locals to be professionally trained as teachers. Funding for this school continues to this day, provided by the Khalifa Foundation, and this has helped uplift an entire generation of children, as you will see in this short video presentation. Normally, Muslims never got opportunities to come to such schools. But uh, with the Khalifa, we got an opportunity. We came together, we sang the same songs, and uh, we shared the same stories. It was actually very lovely to be here. So Tamara has already introduced me, but I'd like to say that I'm involved in curriculum and program design, as well as teaching on the front line. And what I'm going to be doing is giving you some creative teaching methods that we use during the pandemic and could, could also be used after the pandemic. So before I launch into the topic, I want to set the scene. Traditional learning, which we're probably all aware of, familiar with, involves the classroom, there's a presence of a learner and a teacher. 
But when the pandemic hit, we really had to kind of take an online remote learning approach, which is defined as the use of web-based technologies to access learning material independent of FaceTime and learning. Now, an entire generation of students, children, adolescents, and even adult learners were affected by this unprecedented disruption with potential far-reaching impact beyond education. Think about socialization, being active participants in society, and even contributing to the labor workforce. How big is the problem? Well, UNICEF figures in 2020 showed 31% of students globally, that's pre-primary to upper secondary school education, potentially were not receiving online. And just to put a number to that percentage, it's 403 million students. Africa was mentioned in the video, the MENA region and South Asia are also well below those global figures. A recent study examined secondary school students' perception of online learning and their experience during COVID-19, and we're looking at the impact of mental well-being and specific learning difficulties here. Pupils' learning can include their concentration, their engagement, their ability to learn, and even the self-worth they get from learning all of which were significantly lower during online compared to traditional classroom learning. And these differences were more marked in students with specific learning difficulties. And I was really pleased to hear from Emma about radical inclusion, because I really feel that's what we need. UNESCO have reported increased school dropout rates, mainly affecting adolescents, girls, and also those with physical disabilities. However, for me, mental health and learning difficulties are sometimes overlooked. I conducted the largest scale study to date on ADHD comorbidities in the UAE with the Al Jalila Children's Hospital. And globally, we're finding the same trends, how learning difficulties, mental health issues affect schooling and more support and accommodations are required if we really wanna talk about true education inclusion. So learning design needs to focus on social, emotional learning, as well as mental health and psychosocial support. That's urgently needed. Children learn best when they feel safe, they're affirmed, and deeply engaged in supportive communities of learners. So here are some creative approaches to learning and teaching during the pandemic from best practice research and from my own teaching. And they're gonna look at specific academic learning outcomes as well as social and emotional learning outcomes. So collaborative or team teaching really works well when you're working with children with disabilities. So one instructor can be the content specialist, whilst the other is trained in instructional design methodologies to help those students with disabilities. And that improves their academic performance. We know that peer-mediated instruction, also known as peer tutoring or peer-assisted learning, helps emotional as well as academic support. There are lots of creative alternatives for indoor and home education, which have been a hallmark of this pandemic. For example, age appropriate TV or online programs can be used, like this YouTube channel, which teaches yoga to children with disabilities. One of my favorites to use are flipped classrooms. So there's many meta analyses that have looked at the use of flipped classrooms showing improvement in students' learning achievement, as well as their motivation. And again, Dr. Iwan mentioned this idea of engagement and support for students. And that's what I feel the flipped classroom brings in. So traditional classroom, you've got a lot of content, you'll do that in class, and then there may be some homework. Whereas the reverse occurs during a flipped classroom. It's a type of blended learning where students are introduced to the content at home. So they get a journal article, they get uh, content to, to watch or, or read. And then they enter the classroom, either online or in person, and they discuss, they debate, and even problem solve. And I try to engage students using polls and discussions that can de-stress the classroom and also engage critical thinking. For me, gone are the days where students are passive and the job of the educator is information transmission. What we really want are active learners, and that's why we have to use these type of methodologies. Even complex lab experiences can be brought about online using rich simulation packages or virtual reality. So that can increase academic performance, even in subjects where you might need a physical space. The use of learning management systems, we can monitor engagement and also virtual check-in between parents, teachers and learners. And this is analogous to walking through the classroom and making sure that students are doing the right things and also just checking in on their mental health. 
for me, we can recover learning losses post COVID using a hybrid model of online and traditional learning. So along with face-to-face -face interaction, perhaps virtual checking every now and then can help increase inclusivity. And of course, these learning management systems can be used with social media. Let's face it, we learn through phones and tablets and we use social media more than we used to before. So this is an example from my own organizational psychology class where I tweeted about Tesla potentially using humanoid robots. And it got the students engaged talking about work and business and psychology. This is how we need to reimagine education and make it contemporary and relevant for our learners. Time and time again, research has been conducted and shows that people learn more when they enjoy the learning experience. We can create interesting modules through gamification. In a virtual event run by my student society, the Wellbeing Club that I supervise, we design online quizzes using Kahoot to assess knowledge about bipolar disorder. This is a really fun technique. Students log in by the mobile phone or laptop. They can be anonymous or have a fun nickname. And they take part in an online game or quiz. They score points. And there's even a podium for winners. And this type of game-based learning platform brings engagement and fun to education. It was great during the pandemic. And it's definitely something I'd recommend for the future. So finally, I just want to end with a quote. Mark Twain once said, history never repeats itself, but it does often rhyme. There might not be another pandemic quite like this, but we need to be mindful of similar disruption in education. We already know there's great inequality globally in terms of resources and support for education. So the upcoming G20 is a key moment for our leaders to come together to support quality education and help transform our educational systems globally to provide equitable learning for all children and adult learners. We need bold government actions and investments. And together we can create an innovative support system using some of the methodologies that I've discussed and others that have an evidence base and work according to culture and society. We can engage learners, teachers, and of course not forgetting parents and caregivers who had a great educational role during this pandemic. We need to focus on academic success, of course, but we have to ensure health, social, and psychological well-being for all of our stakeholders. Here are my references, and thank you very much for attending today, and thank you to all the organizers for the invitation. Thank you very much, Dr. Jigar, for your very detailed explanation. So we've talked about the needs to build stronger and more resilient education recovery in order to recover together and recover stronger. And a more resilient learning recovery means that ensuring equal access to quality education for everyone, including those who are from the poorest and the most deprived communities, and also um, to figure out the creative approaches on how to make that happen. So we need to think out of the box because you know COVID-19 pandemic has just give us another proof that always don't always necessarily work. So that's why we need to strengthen the uh, blended learning strategies as well as how we can create a more resilient and learning um, recovery to uh, give a positive learning outcomes for all children. And I think in order for us to make that happen, this has a lot to do with the way we frame education financing. So um, apart from the huge learning loss, the incidence of COVID-19 pandemic is taking a devastating toll as well on the world's education financing too. And uh, it comes a time when education budgets are under pressure as governments now shift spending towards to the health and economic response to the pandemic. So education is not really uh, well prioritized, unfortunately, given the uh, COVID-19. So the government has to shift to the health system and also the economic recovery, which made sense as well. But it will be interesting to hear from our expert here on how and why increasing education budgets is actually equally important to recover together and recover stronger. So I'm here joining today with Renee Raya. So Renee is the lead policy analyst uh, for Asia South Pacific Association for Basic and Adult Education. And um, so uh, Shorten as Asbe, and he's also responsible for policy research and advocacy, particularly on education financing, equity, and the right to education. He also leads in SDG research, monitoring and indicator system, including the preparation of the civil society parallel or spotlight reports on the SDG number four implementation status. 
So prior to joining ASPE, Rene has been uh, involved in various development work as a community organizer, peace activist, and poverty monitoring specialist. He also served as a consultant to various international organizations as well as UN agencies. So the floor is yours, Rene, and the next 10 minutes is all yours to take it. Thank you very much, uh, Tamara, and uh, good day to our participants uh, from across many countries. Thank you for staying around uh, and being engaged uh, in this uh, forum. Uh, thank you to Dr. Iwan, to Mr. Suging, and to my co-panelists uh, for you know, sharing very profound points uh, related to education and how we can navigate better uh, through this pandemic and beyond. Uh, for now, I will be uh, sharing and focusing on the macro dimension and specifically on financing equitable uh, education because investing in education is really very important to really move us uh, forward. Okay, so uh, we are all familiar about the massive economic and education impact of COVID-19. Um, global economy has contracted, uh, in, especially in 2020, and there has been a sharp revenue fall, um, estimated at around 15 to 40 percent, and we will feel this over the next uh, few years, even beyond this pandemic. There has been massive job losses and uh, livelihood losses, uh, affecting most especially those who are at the threshold or at the poverty uh, level. Um, and of course, we witness uh, because of this uh, rising poverty. Uh, their uh, estimate is 78 more uh, million, 78 million more have been pushed to extreme poverty uh, globally. Now, uh, that uh, because we need to fight uh, the pandemic, uh, we are also short on our finances, especially uh, the poor and the lower middle income countries. So that is now again back to historic high levels. And this will impact on our fiscal resources and on our uh, education budgets for many years or even decades uh, to come. So it will impact tremendously on the education budgets uh, and public spending could actually drop by 8%, especially uh, among uh, the poorer developing countries. Uh, at the same time, bilateral aid commitment in 2020 has been down by 40%, and it is projected that aid to education can, call, can fall by as much as 12% uh, uh, in the next uh, few years now. So this is a multiple crisis, and it has devastating impact especially on developing countries. Okay, so in terms of education, uh, the other speakers have really elaborated this, and I won't be going through this uh, much, you know, just to say that there has been massive learning losses, dropout, incidents of child labor, mental distress uh, uh, affecting most especially uh, children uh, who are excluded and with uh, disabilities, gender-based violence on the rise, child marriages as uh, uh, elaborated by one of the speakers, early pregnancy and malnutrition. So inequality may have actually widened uh, among marginalized groups uh, who have been further left behind. Uh, this uh, is especially for persons, children with disabilities, girls and women, indigenous peoples, minorities, and refugees. And as I mentioned, uh, yeah, tremendous pressure on education budget and recovery plan, uh, however, uh, really gave, no, um, unfortunately, low priority on education. Uh, Two thirds of low and lower middle income countries actually reported cuts in education budget when this is really the time when we have to recover, we have to uh, uh, recover from learning losses and we need to invest more in education, but you know, the crunch uh, is really felt so much uh, in the education and social sector. Okay, so even before the pandemic, globally and in Asia Pacific, inequity in education remains a serious challenge. 
And this has actually uh, widened in a significant number of countries uh, and exacerbated further by COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, and I guess uh, those most affected women, uh, especially from the poorest 20% of the population and in rural area or in hard to reach area, in low income countries, uh, we can go and say, uh, based on statistics, based on uh, hard data, they have very little or no chances of all of ever completing secondary education, which correlates highly with lifting families and individuals from poverty. So uh, in terms of uh, spending level, uh, most uh, countries, most regions are spending way below the global benchmark uh, set by UNESCO and even recognized uh, by the uh, <coughs> Sustainable Agenda 2030. So Northern Africa, Western Asia, Sub-Saharan Africa, and across most of Asia, South Asia, East Asia, and even Southeast Asia, are uh, spending way below the established global benchmark. Uh, only Latin America, the Caribbean, and Central Asia met both spending uh, benchmark. But of course, the requirements uh, is even more uh, for most countries uh, in the world. Okay, so uh, what is uh, also unfortunate is, you know, fiscal measures to recover from COVID-19, yes, Globally, tremendous investments, uh, fiscal response on co to COVID-19, but uh, they are mostly concentrated in the rich, developed countries, the OECD, across Europe and North America, uh, but less, very much less in uh, poor developing countries. And by sector, UNESCO estimate that education share is just about 0.78% of uh, the total investment uh, in the recovery package. And so this is a clear indication that education has been deprioritized uh, in a situation where we need it most along with the other social sectors. No? So uh, why should government no invest in education uh, what is the you know uh, importance of investing especially during this uh, recovery period from the pandemic why because education is a critical driver for better health and safety for equitable and ex and inclusive growth uh, for information access and critical thinking very much important not to move us forward and for long term resiliency of the education sector and, society, and the broader society. Education correlates very strongly with income, employment, poverty reduction, health practices, effective parenting, addressing domestic violence and child abuse, community involvement and environmental awareness among others. And education is seen as key to move forward to a green, caring, gender fair, sustainable, resilient, and peaceful societies. Okay, so what can make a difference? What are the you know, recommendations that we call together from the series of discussions that we have had? No? Recovery must focus on human capacities and well-being. And with education as a priority in any stimulus package, because, uh, you know, better recovery can be best measured by education, social development, and in environment, environmental indicators, and maybe less fixated on GDP, on macroeconomic uh, indicators. No? Let us invest in human resources in education. Teachers, community educators, parents perform you know, well during the pandemic, uh, and they should be the ones that can really move us forward, an important input uh, for resilient and transformative education. So let's allocate funding for the continuous professional development, training, and mental well-being of teachers and educators. And of course, political will is very important to ensure equity and inclusion in education with funding priority for women and those who are furthest behind. No? So, <clears throat> so uh, uh, what's this? Uh, scale up. We need to scale up programs that deliver uh, and those that can effectively address equity. 
Okay, uh, uh, and uh, I think uh, we need a stronger, more resilient public education system uh, with clear and strong financing commitment and strategy from the government, both at the national and at the local level, with significant and progressive increases in education budgets. No, and increasing. You know, there's always a problem. Where do we get the funds? Uh, where do we get the money? And we know that in an era of declining ODA, and we need to pay for our debts. No, so we need to increase domestic revenues through key tax reforms to make the system progressive. Uh, and we need to end harmful tax incentives that are accorded to big businesses. No, and we need to address illicit funding flows because for many developing countries, we actually lose no billions uh, of uh, dollars no because of uh, illicit funding flows tax evasion uh, tax avoidance which could very well be used to invest in education and human capacity building so we need to also end commercialized education we know that uh, that happened during the pandemic uh, there has been an aggressive push coming from big it firms no, to take advantage of the situation uh, maybe less on helping uh, move forward um, given this crisis. No? So now we need effective regulation of private sector in education to ensure equity, non-discrimination, and really ensure the right to education. And of course, we believe that a vibrant civil society uh, at the national, global, and local level on SDG4 for education, for equity, social justice, and peace will bring us and help us move forward. So with that, thank you very much. Thank you very much for the very comprehensive presentation, Rene. So uh, we're now moving to the next agenda. But before we move to the next agenda, I just would like to take a quick pause here to uh, thank you for those who just joined this webinar and particularly thank you for Mr. Tata. So as a Civil Society 20 Steering Committee members and also a Deputy Chief of Program Impact and Policy of Safety Gender Indonesia. And thank you so much as well for the rest of the audience here who recently just joined. If you did not uh, make it to join the first half of this webinar, don't worry, we can share this recording back to you so then you can uh, catch it up. So um, in the interest of time, um, I think that a, I will start reading some questions as we have received some of them from our audience. But if any one of you would like to ask more, you can write on the chat box or uh, you can unmute yourself if you can't. So uh, I would like first to go to um, Dr. Jigar. So there is a question here on the comment. Um, let me just go through that first. Um, then, yep. So yeah, so there's a question here from, um, I think, uh, Ibu Andri Yoga Utami. So uh, the question is, um, you mentioned how to encourage children to learn using technology and then internet, right? As a part of the 21st century. So it's also uh, something that we cannot avoid. But at the same time, we recognize that that also comes a greater risk, right? There's an addiction to the internet which led to their mental and state well-being as well. And also it led them to maybe uh, browsing inappropriate sites, like a porn site yeah. or maybe there's other inappropriate sites as well. And so there should be like a two side of coin. So how can we mitigate this risk while adopting technology at the same time? If, if I answer comprehensively, we'll need another one hour webinar. So I'll, I'll keep it brief and just give you a few sound bites. Uh, moderation is the key word. Moderation, thinking about age-appropriate content. Um, and two other things that I'd like to add in is a moderation, age-appropriate content. Think about the quantity, how much time is spent online, screen time, because we have data on physical health and, and eyes and, and concentration as well that gets infused when we're on screens for such a long time. Um, and then the quality. So quantity and quality. What's the quality of the material that they're watching, that they're interacting with? Are they passive? Are they just sitting there and just watching stuff? And that's okay. It's more nice just to kind of, you know, veg and be on a, on a, on a sofa or a couch and just, you know, drown yourself in Netflix or, or YouTube now and then. But it's how long you do that for. And if it's just a recreational thing that you do for, say, half an hour a day, I don't think there's too much wrong with it. But if that's all you do on the internet, then of course that's wrong. If it's interactive, it's engaging content, teaching skills, competencies, for example, like I gave you with the teaching of yoga 
online to children with disabilities, uh, teaching cooking skills. YouTube can be a valuable resource if used wisely. So I think those elements of moderation, quantity, quality, and age appropriate viewing, really important. Yep, thank you very much. Yes, um, I personally do agree with that. I think in terms of online uh, exposure, especially for younger children, it requires parental and school moderation, you know, because uh, children themselves um, are not yet um, old enough to identify which sites that they can check and then which sites they, they, that they cannot check. So in this case, I think it links to how um, we can also strengthen the blended learning system to making sure that parents as well as school authorities can also be a part of this as well. So um, I would like to turn to Putri right now. Putri, if you're still here on the line, yes, you are. So uh, yes, so you also, um, I think you mentioned on your speech that uh, the COVID-19 uh, has led to the rising number of online violence and child marriage. So uh, I wanna know about your personal experience as you, as a young female yourself. So can you tell us the role of youth to bring about positive change? And, and the inequalities. And um, you can also maybe share your message uh, about the uh, what you expect the G20 leaders prior to the G20 summit can do in order to mitigate this. And definitely you can answer in Bahasa if you prefer. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Uh, let me answer in Bahasa. Uh, terima kasih banyak, uh, Tamara, untuk pertanyaannya. Berbicara tentang uh, young female leaders or young female activists, um, ini menurut Putri punya power yang sungguh luar biasa untuk membawa perubahan di lingkungannya. Putri melihat potensi dari teman-teman aktivis, orang-orang uh, muda yang menyadari, melihat realita dengan penuh kesadaran bahwasannya ada sesuatu yang nggak beres, ada sesuatu yang bermasalah dan mereka memutuskan untuk bersuara, itu merupakan salah satu, uh, salah satu tombak dari perubahan. Dan orang-orang dewasa, para stakeholders, pemerintah, itu sangat-sangat di kami sangat-sangat ingin didengarkan gitu ya. Jadi uh, menurutku keterlibatan dari uh, kelompok muda itu bisa membantu uh, bapak ibu sekalian dalam pengambilan keputusan, pengambilan kebijakan yang uh, yang lebih inklusif, yang lebih sustainable karena mempertimbangkan. Uh, permasalahan dari si pemilik masalah yaitu anak dan orang muda jadi um, the power of uh, youth voice uh, children voice itu uh, perlu diakomodir gitu ya jadi um, saya dari Child and Youth Advisory Network sangat-sangat mengharapkan partisipasi yang bermakna dalam setiap pengambilan keputusan dalam setiap uh, perancangan program terkecuali di uh, G20 Summit nanti seperti itu Kak Tamara Thank you very much, Putri. Yes. Uh, so I just would like to uh, retranslate that a little bit in case, you know, um, many of the audience could not make it to the interpreter. So yes, Putri explained that actually the role of awareness among young female leaders have been happening in many countries, including in Indonesia. But uh, I think we still need some support from the government as well as world leaders to making sure that they're also being included in the decision making process. So in any kind of discussion or political discussion, uh, Putri ex uh, expected that uh, uh, the government could include youth as well as young female leaders to make sure that their voice are not just being heard but also they can exercise their rights as well as the agency to making sure that they can be a part of the solution so it's not just about raising their voice but also they can be included in any part of discussion so thanks a lot very much Putri, for your uh, comprehensive answers and uh, the next one, uh, I would like to go to Emma. So Emma, you mentioned about uh, focusing on the most deprived and marginalized communities, which makes a lot of sense because the, they have been you know, experiencing these problems a long time, even, even before the pandemic. So it makes more sense to put them at the heart of the recovery. So I just would like to turn uh, the coin into the other side. Um, let's say that if the government of world leaders, particularly the G20 leaders, are failed to address this, what would happen to these, you know, the overall inequality around the world? Thanks for that great question. Um, well, 
yeah, inequality will just increase further and further and uh, we won't meet the commitment to leave uh, no child behind that was made in 2015 around the sustainable goals um, and the agenda that was set out there. So governments won't be um, meeting their commitment. Um, there will you know, be, and it's not just a small number of children who are um, facing inequality. You know, there's so many that we've touched on who don't just have kind of one um, characteristic that makes them uh, more vulnerable, but actually there are many intersecting um, inequalities uh, that prevent children from accessing uh, quality and safe, inclusive education. So um, we really need governments to take this, take this very seriously and not just think about the children that are easy to access. Um, and uh, we need to think, as I was saying earlier, about a radical inclusion approach where you really think about those, who those children are first when you're designing um, you know, the education system and the outreach to those children. And I think this really comes down to getting the really good data. Um, we still know that there are many children around who, the world who are invisible in education management uh, information systems, um, such as um, displaced children, refugees, internally displaced children particularly, um, but as well as, you know, girls and children in rural areas and disabled children who just aren't kind of being counted um, in, in data, in the education management data systems. Um, and without knowing where they are, who they are, um, the experiences that they have it's difficult for education systems and other um, education providers to really think carefully about how to reach those children and I think something as well is that this data needs to be um, regularly updated we can't just do this on an annual basis where we collect data on these children but we need to know on a more regular basis um, which children are dropping out and why so that we can really um, address that in a timely fashion and not just kind of wait to the end of the year and realize that you know hundreds of children have, have dropped out of that school in that region um, so yeah that would be my response really um, if we don't do something now inequality will increase and this will have huge impacts not just on the children themselves and uh, we've already heard of kind of some of the protection risks um, that occur when children aren't in school, but also their learning, their well-being, but also more societal um, impacts as well. We know that um, lack of inequality, lack of education, and education inequality can actually increase the chances of um, lack of social cohesion, increases conflict. Um, so, yeah, it's vitally important that um, education um, reaches every single child around the world. Yep, thank you very much, Emma. And it's actually reminds me that, uh, you know, the COVID-19 has given us another proof that, um, you know, unless access to education is made equal, then we're only widening the gap, right? Mm -hmm. And it's also the importance of relying on the data before making any kind of decision. So we can always root back into the behavioral insights and then what actually needed to be done because there's no one size fits all solution after all. So in that case, um, uh, I have a question for Renee. So um, I think, Renee, uh, we all aware that education budgets are not the same, right, from one country to the next. Like, for example, you mentioned that developed countries may not have a problem in terms of educational financing compared to less developed countries. So uh, I want to know, in your point of view, what richer countries can do in order to elevate investment in education for less developed countries? And do you see there's a role for richer countries to support the less developed countries and what can they do to to the um, inequalities yes uh, actually uh, there has been a number of uh, un resolutions related to how uh, you know developed countries the richer ones um, can allocate and earmark a certain portion of their uh, wealth no for developing countries in the form of uh, uh, ODA, uh, Official Development Assistance, but this has never been fulfilled uh, to the degree, uh, to the extent that has been mandated by the United Nations uh, many, many decades ago. Um, and so uh, we uh, appeal and uh, call on our uh, you know, governments uh, from the donor community, from the OECD, uh, to first of all, really look into how they can uh, uh, fulfill the mandate that uh, they have actually accepted, you know, 
uh, in order to sustain support for developing countries. But at the same time, I think uh, governments uh, from developing countries uh, should also uh, strengthen solidarity uh, so that they are, they are able to you know, help each other uh, to strengthen South-to-South -South cooperation uh, and engage uh, the OECD countries, uh, the donor community related to the issues of debt, related to the issues of you know, monitoring uh, uh, and avoiding uh, tax havens uh, because uh, it is actually uh, the uh, rich uh, nations uh, that are responsible for, you know, taking off such uh, wealth away from developing countries. Uh, and so if there is a, a tax system that can work uh, at the global level where developing countries can have, you know, equal opportunity for decision making, uh, then I think uh, that could make a lot of uh, you know, th that could be the least that uh, we can expect uh, from the OECD community. Then I think uh, the role of civil society uh, is very important, a vibrant civil society. Uh, and we have uh, seen this during the pandemic that uh, one of the positive uh, development was the solidarity among different sectors, among different civil society organizations to bring the issue forward. Thank you. Thank you very much, Renee. Yes, uh, I think that uh, it should be like a public commitment in terms of, you know, um, increasing the education budget. So uh, it should be involved into uh, many different actors of education to make that happen. And um, I would like to give the floor to the audience here if you would like to unmute your mic or maybe write your questions on the chat box so then we can pick it up. So over to anyone. I'm hoping that all of you can unmute your mic, but if you can't, please do let us know in the chat box so we can pick it up. Right, I think while we wait, uh, oh, sorry, there's a question here from Sharani. So thanks for the question, Sharani. So um, it's not really stated to, to whom this question, but I believe this should be open to anyone who would like to answer. So um, Sharani asks us how, are you to address cultural diversity, uh, especially, especially providing education in their own language, uh, particularly for indigenous community children. So I think uh, it's more relevant to Dr. Jigar, I would say. So how that you can ensure that the cultural diversity is being maintained uh, in our education, as particularly if you know things are now moving to online where children are being isolated. So how they can embrace diversity still. Uh, including cultural diversity in education should have been there pre-pandemic and then should always be there. I think you've got to use examples for that are culturally relevant here in the United Arab Emirates. I'm fellow educators try to do that a lot. I think the learning material needs to be relevant, keeping in mind certain sensitivities. Um, I think that's done by most educators anyway. I would give them credit for doing that. I think when you're online, it's about finding local resources if you can. Um, we just heard from uh, a student learner, Putri, who's, who's you know fantastic, and that that type of, of local knowledge and community involvement will really need to be harnessed if you want that cultural diversity in educational systems, and that will work at all levels from primary onwards. So getting in local involvement using culturally relevant examples and sensitive material. Those are the three things I would say. Yeah. Uh, yep, and would like to do it? Yeah, go ahead, go ahead, Emma, sure. Thank you. I just wanted to come on, on the back of um, that point because I think it's a really good one about um, locally led activity and organizations. And one of the recommendations on my long list of eight things on that slide was actually um, what we're calling shifting power. and um, we are really trying to encourage that localization agenda um, whereby we work with local organizations in a variety of different groups. They might be kind of indigenous community groups, women's groups and others to really help shape from the beginning what the education response should be in a number of these contexts. As they really know, you know, they have experienced it themselves, they know what they need. Um, and sometimes this takes more time and sometimes more money, but that kind of needs to be um, 
built into to the approach and donors or education ministers need to kind of be aware of that and really value that input because I think in the long term um, having that locally led action really has a lot of impact um, for children's learning. Thank you very much for uh, the addition points that am I and thanks for the answer, Dr. Jigar. Yes, um, I think when it comes to accommodating children with disabilities or children with, you know, um, additionally indigenous children, I think it's best to put the local language at the heart so that, you know, they can understand the education landscape at first and then the knowledge first before moving on to, you know, um, introducing them to other types of culture. So it's important for them to understand about their local, local culture first, as well as their local language before moving on to the others. So, um, so yes, uh, so um, I'm still opening the floor for the audience here if you would like to unmute your mic or ask your questions on the chat box. Um, but meanwhile, while we're waiting for that, um, I just would like to uh, reconnect back to Putri. So uh, Putri, you mentioned about the role of youth uh, and then being a part of the, this, this decision making. And you also uh, emphasize about the gender barriers, uh, particularly during this pandemic and how the governments and the world leaders can do to mitigate that. But I'm also curious to hear your thoughts about um, what do you think the schools or the teachers or the parents can do to you know, um, promoting gender equality? And then also uh, how that you think the the, the role of uh, families and the, the communities uh, can build like a positive learning for girls as well. And you can answer in Bahasa definitely. Okay, thank you Tamara. Um, berbicara tentang pendidikan untuk anak perempuan dan laki-laki seperti apa yang sudah uh, saya sampaikan tadi, ternyata referensi sosial menempatkan uh, anak perempuan lebih rendah dibanding anak laki-laki, dan ternyata uh, stigma culture yang berlaku di masyarakat tadi uh, membuat perempuan uh, anak perempuan kehilangan uh, akses dan kesempatan-kesempatan yang sebenarnya bisa mereka dapat secara setara, seperti itu. Dan keluarga, uh, kom komunitas itu memainkan peran yang sangat penting uh, karena karena komunitas dan keluarga menjadi tempat anak untuk bertumbuh, uh, mengenal apa peran-peran mereka, apa saja yang bisa mereka akses, uh, bagaimana anak bisa memainkan, uh, anak perempuan juga punya akses dan kontrol terhadap kesempatan-kesempatan uh, dan ruang-ruang yang sama. Namun sayangnya uh, di komunitas uh, dan masih di banyak keluarga, menempatkan perempuan selalu di domestic work, selalu uh, menempatkan perempuan Um, memiliki peran-peran di dapur atau di sumur di dinding-dinding uh, rumah yang yang jauh dari uh, eksplorasi dunia yang lebih luas dan ini sangat-sangat disayangkan dan menjadi salah satu keraguan untuk teman-teman perempuan apakah saya bisa uh, melanjutkan ke pendidikan yang lebih tinggi padahal uh, komunitas dan apa persepsi masyarakat memproyeksikan bahwasannya masa depan perempuan uh, hanya sampai di Uh, di, di, di rumah saja seperti itu itu yang sedang kita perjuangkan bahwasannya perempuan juga layak untuk mendapatkan uh, pendidikan menembus sektor-sektor publik uh, peran-peran strategis uh, atau bahkan kepemimpinan di, di, di negara kita di sektor pemerintahan atau dimanapun yang mereka mau jadi uh, itu yang sedang kami perjuangkan yang melahirkan lebih banyak lagi pemimpin-pemimpin perempuan, anak-anak perempuan yang uh, berpendidikan tinggi uh, untuk bisa uh, untuk bisa mengambil alih dan bisa mendapatkan uh, panggung untuk bersuara dan dan juga didengarkan. Mungkin uh, seperti itu dari uh, saya kembali ke kata Mara. Thank you very much, Putri. Yes, indeed, uh, Putri mentioned that, you know, the role of families, parents and communities are very, very critical to build, you know, the uh, children's capacity and children's understanding about gender equality. And uh, unfortunately, this, uh, this doesn't happen in many households. So there are many other households who are still struggling to understand what gender equality is, which is why, uh, going back to her point, that it's important to include young female leaders who are already aware to be like the, the champion to educate people 
people around them about this gender equality, particularly girls' rights to education. So thank you very much for your very comprehensive uh, answer, Putri. I just have one last uh, question, and um, this is for uh, Renee. So uh, Renee, you mentioned a very valid point about uh, allocating budgets and uh, for the educational financing, but can you please explain more what kind of budgets or uh, that should be allocated for the importance aspect of education, whether it's teacher training or whether it's school infrastructure or whether it's, it's any other type of the educational investment. So if you can please name three, the most important aspects where the budget should go to and why, I think they'll be, they'll be uh, interested to hear. Uh, I think, uh, as I mentioned, uh, human uh, resource capacity building involving teachers, uh, gra grassroots educators should be uh, uh, one of the top priorities uh, when we invest. Secondly, I think uh, we should really prioritize allocation for those who are left behind. Uh, they have always been at the last uh, in the least of most governments. And so what comes to them would be really uh, the leftovers or the trickles. And so this time around, let us invest and first uh, in looking into uh, girls and women, secondly, on persons with disabilities, children with disabilities, third, those who are in far flung uh, communities, uh, uh, those who are in hard to reach areas and ethnic minorities, uh, because uh, if we don't do this now, they will forever be left behind. And so in our budgeting, we should put them on top of the list rather than, you know, um, you know, make do of what, uh, whatever is uh, left out uh, in the budget process. So I think uh, these are the top priorities. And secondly, uh, and thirdly, I think uh, community learning centers would be very important. They have proven to be very valuable during the pandemic, community-based learning. Uh, so I would also go for increasing the allocation for non-formal, informal, and community learning centers uh, that uh, can provide you not only second chance education, but also alternative education, because I believe, we believe that there are multiple pathways to learning. Thank you. Thank you very much, Renee. And yes, um, I believe that there's no straightforward answer to that because one country's uh, priorities might be different from the other countries, right? And I think this is also important to understand about the data first into what's really needed to be done in the country and then make sure that we have an enough budget to be allocated for that. So um, thank you very much again uh, for everyone, for the panelists here. Thank you very much, Putri from the Child and Advocacy Network, Youth Network here. Thank you so much, Dr. Jigar from the Halifa Foundation. Thank you so much, Renee, for um, Asia Pacific South Association for Basic and Adult Education. And thank you, Emma, for the, uh, say, for the presentation from Save the Children UK. So I enjoyed it a lot and uh, I hope all of you all did too. But in the interest of time, I really apologize for not being able to pick up uh, all the questions. Uh, but please note that all questions and comments uh, are well taken and we can address them on our next series of the global webinar or uh, if you would like you can also email us with your queries but uh, before we close I just would like to give a quick recap of what we have discussed today so we first heard from uh, Dr. Iwan Shahril on the G20 education working group strategies to overcome educational inequalities and education recovery and the post-COVID-19 world and then uh, the discussion followed by our youth representative here, Putri Gayatri. Putri shared her experience and insights for learning and educational opportunities, especially for girls and also violence-free environment. And also connected to uh, what Putri has presented, uh, Emma also emphasized policy strategies for government and donors to ensure equitable learning for disadvantaged students, including girls, children with disabilities, and those in disaster-prone areas to keep the learning in a violence-free environment. And we also had uh, Dr. Jigar presented initiatives to provide creative approaches of learning and teaching during and after the pandemic uh, for the better academic, social and emotional learning outcomes. And the discussion also followed by Renee that showed us some key strategies to ensure equitable funding for education, uh, including teacher competency, development program, equal access to learning, community based learning for marginalized groups and other resources can be uh, can be uh, can be achieved. 
And uh, yeah, on behalf of the team, I would like to say my warmest thanks one again to all the panelists here. Thank you for your time and your amazing speeches today. And a big thank you to all of you who are attending this session online. And I apologize once again for not being able to pick up all questions, but we're consolidating all feedback and comments and it will be streamlined into our C20 policy papers. Please know that your voice is critical to influence public as well as the leaders to recover together, recover stronger because you are hurt. Thank you very much once again and bye for now. Thank you everyone. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you very Thank much, you. Emma, Rene. All, all the best. All the best. Bye bye. Thank you. And also, Katamara. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone.